this, this gospel text, the feeding of the 5,000, brings a, a sense of familiarity, does it not? Many of us have heard this story over and over again. Even the little ones know it. How often have you imaged out in your mind this text as you've heard it read? That mountainside sloping down toward the Galilean Sea, hundreds of people sitting there listening to Jesus teach others, coming up the mountain with family members or friends to be healed, word spreading in the villages below about what Jesus is doing, and so more and more are coming, about 5,000 of them. And time gets away from them. An evening is approaching. Jesus, Jesus becomes aware of their need for food. The disciples find a little boy with five barley loaves and two fish. They bring that to Jesus. Jesus blesses it, breaks it, gives it to the disciples to feed, and feeds them all with 12 baskets full left over. And the conclusion of the teaching is, we are to share with others from our abundance even as we wait for that final Eucharistic meal in heaven. It's a beautiful story and brings comfort to our souls. The only problem is this is Matthew's account of the feeding of the 5,000 men besides women and children. That takes us up to a total of at least 20,000, if not more. And once more, there's no little boy here. No little boy. Only disciples asking Jesus to send the people away so they can go buy food for themselves. As if there were a McDonald's or a Burger King just down the road. You feed them, Jesus instructs the disciples. And then listen to this. In Matthew's account, they, the disciples, are the ones with the five loaves and the two fish. They have the food. Bring them here to me, Jesus says. And after taking the loaves, blessing them, and giving them to the disciples to distribute, all those thousands of people are fed, again, with 12 baskets full left over. Biblical scholars urge us to take note that while the traditional interpretations of this miracle are not inaccurate, Matthew is asking us to think outside the box with him about this miracle. For example, while the other Gospels, the other three Gospels, mention the beheading of John the Baptist just prior to this event, Matthew heightens it. He includes a detailed account of John's beheading and reports that when Jesus heard that John was dead, Jesus withdrew in a boat by himself to grieve and for sure to ponder his own journey that was lying ahead. But the people won't leave him alone. They follow him on foot, motioning to him from the shore to come and tend to them. And Jesus, Matthew tells us, had compassion for them. He came ashore and he cured their sin. What a contrast Matthew draws between the banquet of Herod and the banquet of Jesus. Herod's banquet takes place in his richly adorned palace, full of all those worldly possessions, most of which he's gained falsely at the expense of others. It's his birthday. Wine is flowing. Food is bountiful, at least for the guests. And the daughter of Herodias dances. And it was her mother, you remember, who was married both to Herod and to Philip, his brother. And John had named that sin as what put him in prison. And now as the daughter of Herodias dances and drunken Herod promises her anything she wants, her mother said, ask for the head of John the Baptist. And so it's done. Greed. Gluttony, pride, immorality, sin, death. Those are the active ingredients of the banquet of Herod. And Jesus' banquet? Well, at this banquet, Jesus, full of compassion for the people, hears their sick, tends their needs, shares with them his food. And somehow present needs, not just eternal needs, but 
present needs, physical, emotional, spiritual, are met right there on that mountainside. And the day ends well. Compassion, sharing, humility, caring, life. Those are the active ingredients at the banquet of Jesus. So then comes that question, so what? So what? How does this text speak to us today? And for me, Matthew's account of the feeding of the 5,000 men besides women and children pulls us back from this 21st century gone mad with greed and pride and gluttony and immorality and sin and death, hitting us over the head, if you will, with a two by four and calling us to remember to claim our heritage of grace and mercy and love from God given to us in the death and resurrection of His Son. And also calling us to live that Christian life in this world gone mad. To remember we are not of this world, but in this world to make a difference in the name of Jesus. It's interesting, isn't it? That in this account, it's the disciples who come to Jesus and ask him to send the people away. Sort of a false, shallow concern. Could they have their hunger? They need to leave now. But Jesus turns the table on them. They need not go away. You feed them. You give them something to eat. You do it. And they find a way. They bring their bread and their fish to Jesus. He blesses it, breaks it, feeds all who are hungry. All eat and are filled. David Loves, my favorite theologian, as you know, suggests that there are two real miracles in this story, neither of which is the physical multiplication of bread, nor even the lofty spiritual nature of the miracle. Rather, he says, miracle number one is that Jesus renews, embodies, and fulfills the consistent call of the God of Israel to feed the hungry. Isaiah reminds us of that. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You that have no money, come and buy and eat. And listen, I will make with you an everlasting covenant. And the second miracle, the second miracle, David says, is that Jesus uses the disciples even when they would rather look away from needs, even when they would rather look at themselves, send those people away, close doors, make judgments, let others take care of their own, even when they would do that. Jesus uses them as instruments of compassion. Because you see, in the presence of Jesus, those disciples, just like the bread and the fish, were transformed so that they might feed the hungry. Dr. Lowe suggests that this miracle still continues today, that somehow Jesus takes us, self-centered, judging, exclusive, greedy people, and in his presence, through word and sacrament, turns us into people who feed hungry people. He suggests that we need to become more capable of seeing God in action and that we need to become more aware of our call from God to action in the name of Jesus. So, in your bulletin, you all got either a loaf of bread or a fish. Okay? Here's your challenge for the week. I want you to go and do some act of compassion this week. You need not make a public show of it. Just go and do the deed. And then write it down. Write it down on your fish or on your loaf of bread and bring it with you to worship next Sunday. And we will receive these offerings of yours along with our financial offerings, which by the way also need to multiply. <laughs> and ask God's blessing upon them that our offerings multiply and feed the world. On the door of the media center in the North Carolina Senate office, Catherine Fink has this cartoon posted. A person says to a pastor, Pastor, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God 
why there were so many hungry people in the world. And the pastor replies, I think God is going to ask us the same question. Amen. Amen.